Hey, Steve Olson here with FIG. I'm at Porter's Crossing in Eagle Mountain, Utah right now. And we got to thinking the other day that it might be kind of cool to go out to some of the past FIG projects and compare. What did they look like? What were the numbers like when we originally released them to investors versus how are they performing now? And we originally started taking reservations here at Porter's Crossing in January of 2017. So you can see there's been some time elapsed. And this project was a long time in the making. Typically these things start at least a year before we begin talking to investors about them at all. So January 2017 is when we started mentioning this to the investors. October of 2018 is when the very last unit turned over and got its official certificate of occupancy. And what happens at that point is now we begin the, the final stretch of lease up. Granted, leasing was well underway prior to the last unit turning over and being completed. But whenever you turn over a bunch of units in October, you got a little bit of a slug ahead of you because you're getting into fall and winter. So it was the following spring that everything was finally all the way rented up. And here we sit in this project now, occupancy is consistently in the mid to high 90s. It's a good growing area and continues to grow. To give you some stats before we head into the studio to talk about it, we were looking at just shy of 100 units in this subdivision. Playground, little, uh, a uh, little clubhouse, lots of tenants parking during our videos, which is a good sign. So we're going to cut to the studio for just a minute to look at the pro forma then versus what's happening now. Hey, everybody, I finally made it into the studio to get into the numbers at Porter's Crossing. If you recall, we gave you some high level information about that project. But now I've been able to go through the numbers for a particular fourplex. I picked one in the project, had the property manager send me the rent rolls for the first month until now that the project was fully, or I'm sorry, the unit was fully rented. So what we had was a track record of 27 months. And that's where the numbers were kind of derived from for this. I did the math and I'm excited to give you the results here. I picked a random unit within the development that one of our clients owned in the earlier phases of the project. And what we have to consider, you know, take this with a bit of a grain of salt, is that our costs sometimes don't average out per per unit, it's more of a development thing. So this is per unit. There could be some fourplexes that did better or worse than this one. But generally when you're talking about four units, in this case over 27 months, you do get a pretty good of idea of what you really have on your hands here. So let's take a look at this. The original purchase price for this investor off of the pro forma, considering his upgrades that he did and everything was $678,000. That's what he paid for the fourplex. I ran a couple of comparables, the two most recent comparables. One is in this same subdivision. It sold on July 2nd, 2020, during the heat of the pandemic for $899,000. Another one that's interesting to note, February 19th, not that long ago of 2021, wasn't in the same development, but it was in another fig community right across the street. This particular fourplex is probably 200 yards away is all. And it's a, it's a similar floor plan layout, kind of a three story, actually a little bit smaller square footage than this one sold for 990. A lot of investor activity lately. So that's where we ended up on values. Let's talk about rents. We projected $1,370 a month per unit on the pro forma, right? This one originally started slower, has come back up. Unit A is currently rented at 1350. By the way, this includes all the fees, right? Technology fees, pet fees, anything. So I just did an overall gross rent. $1,350 for unit A, $1,320 for B, $1,370 for C, $1,320 for D. So one of them hit it, the others were a couple of bucks off. Let's talk about vacancy rate. We originally projected a 3% vacancy rate. I went back on the rent rolls from the property manager um, averaging everything out, looked at when we didn't hit our full projected NOI, vacancy rate ended up being 2% instead. So um, a little bit lower on rents, a little bit better on vacancy. So far, obviously a lot better on value. Let's talk about interest rates. Now this one, it really is kind of a moment in time. There's a lot of interest rate news happening as I record this, this video in March of 2021. The pro forma called for an interest rate of 5%. That's what we felt like it was going to be close to at the time. Uh, right now, investors have been doing refinances at 3.625. Uh, 
I ran a calculation at four. I felt like, what if this client had refinanced sometime in the last 12 months to move down from a rate of five to maybe maybe four, okay? So what that means is you'd have an original principal and interest of $2,730, assuming a 5% interest rate, bumping it, bumping it to the four, we're at 2428. So we got some savings there. And like I said, I don't get hung up too much on that one because rates go up, rates go down. The point is take advantage of them when they're low, but income property, if the cash flow is there, can still make a lot of sense even when they're up. So on taxes, right? We're obviously going to be low on the pro forma considering what has happened on the values. We originally projected $4,000 a month, or I'm, I'm sorry, a year in property taxes. I looked it up on the county. The 2020 assessed values are at 4510 a year. Insurance, we projected 42 bucks a month. It's actually at 38 And that's an HO6, you know, the walls in because the HOA covers the bulk of the insurance on these deals. So this is where this particular client ended up on, on insurance. And that really is subject to a variety of things like your deductible that you choose, different coverage items. So you as an investor have a little bit of control over that based on the risk that you want to take. HOA pro formas. We, we had projected 150 bucks a door per month. This one right now is sitting at 177 a door, 27 months later. That's pretty normal, really, because what happens is we, we've not yet had a, a special assessment at FIG. We typically fully fund reserve studies, and our HOA collects for those. So the money is there when capital improvements need to be made. But you do see dues increases over time because water service, trash service, uh, cable, some of these things, they go up over time. So you got to gradually ratchet those up. Um, when we look at further cleaning and maintenance, this is one that was different. I think he must have had a nasty tenant. We projected 75 bucks a month. We say, hey, save 75 bucks a month for that rainy day when you've got some repairs to be made on your brand new unit. Now, we'd probably be telling them save well over 100 now, given that we're years later. The units are getting older, right? You got to save more. He actually averaged out to about 226 a month over that 27 months. And the funny thing was, is it came in like one chunk. Most of the time he had none. Then I looked at one particular month where he had like a lot, like five grand. So I think there were two move outs. That's when I noticed on the vacancy trajectory with the property. So there's probably a whole bunch of carpet cleaning and a bunch of repairs. Must have, must have been a tenant that was pretty rough on the unit. So 226 versus 75 projected. And where this gets to us on the monthly cash flow projection, a true net. We're taking the gross rents received. We're backing out mortgage, taxes, insurance, HOA, vacancy, maintenance, right? Everything that we can think of. Original projection was at 1201 per month. He end, ends up right now, as we take this snapshot in time, at $1,059.80 projected. So it's about a, what are we looking, 150 bucks or so off. Some of these criteria, and this is pretty normal, are too high, too low. And once again, it's a moment in time. You really have to capture it over time to see what happens. Right now, as we're going through leasing, we're, we're getting at pro forma on some projects, below, above, on others. Like I said, we got to watch it over time. But all in all, the pro formas usually turn out to be pretty close to what investors expect. And this has been an interesting one. We'll do another one soon with another project. We'll have some that are far better, some that are not as good as pro forma. We like to give you the good, bad, and the ugly here. So I get asked a lot about how do FIG projects perform on, on average. When we say FIG projects, you got to take some context with that because a normal FIG project is probably anywhere from 100 to 300 doors. And that could be chopped up into anywhere from 30 to 60 different fourplexes. So if you were to look at that project like it was an apartment complex, right? You've got one ledger, you can track all the expenses. It all averages out. FIG projects are a little different because investor Bob could have a different experience than investor Jane, right? One of them maybe has great tenants, stay forever. One of them got a couple of crappy tenants. We all know what a bad tenant can do to a property, right? And it takes a little bit of time to recover from that. But I'm really just here to kind of give a ma macro level of how FIG projects perform as a whole. When we look at a pro forma, we have to remember it's a projection. We're looking at the market 18 to 24 months in advance. 
we're trying to give a very, very educated estimate on what it's going to do. We can look at the market for rents. We can look up tax rates, right? We can look at insurance and really do our best on all of these things. And the only guarantee is this, is that we're going to be wrong on every single one of them. It doesn't mean the pro forma is wrong. What it means is some categories are going to be way high, way low, a little high, a little low, but they really do tend to average out and everything. When you blend it all together, it ends up being about what an investor would project it to be. I've seen this happen a couple of times on the extremes. You know, there was one project, uh, particularly in Texas, that wasn't as good. The lease up took longer. There was a lot of, a lot of different moving parts on that one. But actually, once we did get everybody leased up, the cap rate ended up being pretty solid. Um, one of the reasons is the property tax bill came in significantly lower than we originally anticipated. So a longer lease up, 150 bucks per door lower in rent due to some market conditions, it ended up being a wash at the end of the day. So when you're patient and you work through these, they, t- they tend to work out. I've got another one that was in uh, Utah that did significantly better. Everybody was calling saying, give me more of those. I can't guarantee more of those. Rents ended up being $100 higher per door than we originally thought. Now, that that doesn't give you as much oomph and much punch as you as you think, because what chases that rent? Well, your property taxes are going to find it eventually. So your tax bill will go up a little, but it does net you more positive cash flow. Over time, I've noticed that the best results come for the investors who are patient and they watch those interest rates. If the interest rates are high, but your cash flow is there, you know that investment's going to work because you've got a worst case scenario there. And if the cash flow works on a worst case scenario, you know that typically you can only really make it better over time because if those rates dip a half or a full percent, that's when we come in, we refinance, we lower our mortgage payment, and even without changing everything else, we've got a better a better cash flow basis on our property. So all in all, if you take it out over about three years, they end up about where we thought. In the short term, some look better, some look worse, but patience is the key in real estate investing, especially when it comes to rental properties.